Welcome to the Global Health Series. I'm Vivian Kopsinger Birchall, your host. And with me is the amazing Rebka Adnofu from Johns Hopkins University. Welcome to the series. Welcome, Vivian. Good I to almost, be here. <laughs> yeah, it's always great to have a conversation with you. You're one of the people who really inspires me. You energize me. You're passionate about healthcare, um, addressing healthcare inequities. So uh, just for the sake, for the benefit of our viewers who haven't po possibly heard from you before, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do, and how it interacts with the Global Health Catalyst? Uh, okay, very good. Yes, I would love to do that. My name is Rilka Tanafu, and I'm originally from Ethiopia, so I'm Ethiopian-American, so I've been here for many, many years. And, um, and actually, when I immigrated from Ethiopia at the age of 15, I knew right then and there what I wanted to do was uh, address uh, public health issues globally. Um, and so I'm here, and I am at Johns Hopkins, as you said, at the School of Medicine. I'm doing a variety of things. I'm involved in cancer uh, prevention, and I have a study with uh, Dr. Wilnois, uh, our colleague. And I'm also working on a fabulous leadership program for our community leaders engaged in health, addressing health equity in Baltimore City, and it's called the Bunting Neighborhood Leadership Program, and I've been director of that program for about six years now. And, um, and then I do other, other stuff. I uh, promote um, adolescent development and uh, training for those that work with young people in the company that I own called R&D Associates <laughs> in, in Baltimore. And the last thing I want to mention is that I am the founder and president of RDA Africa, headquartered in Ethiopia. And, and we focus on uh, three pillars, and that's uh, construction and engineering, and um, health and pharmacy, and hospitality. You're quite a busy lady. Uh, but with that said, you know, I have had a few conversations with you via Zoom, you know, about all these disparities that exist that need to be addressed. But why was it important for you to be a part, to come to the Global Health Card List? Uh, what are some of the potential collaborations mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. you see? Mm -hmm. And uh, how would it interact with what you do already? Mm -hmm. I've always been interested in um, health disparities and inequities because growing up in Ethiopia, I saw so much of that, and that is really why I wanted to study um, health. And I came here and continued to pursue that path by first starting uh, studying biology and then uh, getting my master's in, in public health. And with that degree, I said my primary focus would be on addressing uh, minority health issues, um, so, because that's where the greatest inequalities are. So, I've been engaged in that and working in the area of violence prevention, injury prevention, um, and youth development, and, and now um, more so around uh, cancer prevention research and study. Um, so, that is how I ended up being involved in, in health equity work. It just came naturally. And you won't believe, Vivian, it was a, this red book in fourth grade that I picked up and it said from our library in the school that says health. And I read it. That was it. I was like, this is what I want to do. I really remember the book. I read book that <laughs> health. What about grade. that book struck you? That's very interesting. What's, you know, it's like, learning about how our body functions and how we expose ourselves to diseases and how we can really prevent, uh, uh, you know, promote our own health and prevent diseases. So all that fascinated me. And that's why I wanted to study biology first for a deeper understanding of how our body functions before I went on to study public health. And at that time, and I'm aging myself, when I, <laughs> when I went to grad school, believe it or not, there were only 14 uh, public health schools in the whole country uh, here in the United States. And now almost every major university has a, a degree in, in, in public health. That's how we have grown to really see the importance of not just medicine, but public health, and how together they can work together to promote global global health. And that's, um, that's really what's one of the things that excites me in terms of our development and our approach to working with people and promoting health, not just you know, from medical practices, but public health, and that has grown a lot. Um, so I'm, I'm so glad to be in this, uh, in this place. Uh, what are some of the things that have struck out for you? Is this, this is your second year with the Global Health yes. Catalyst, right? So what are some of the things that have struck out for you, either as best practices or as aha moments mm -hmm. that yeah, you'd like to see yeah. boosted? 
Yeah. There were quite a few things that I um, that I observed and I was excited about, and um, and and it includes in terms of the extent of uh, incre uh, efforts to increase awareness about um, non communicable diseases and how that is a factor, a growing factor in terms of our mort mortality rate in, in Africa. So we tend to think about you know malaria, malaria and AIDS and other infectious diseases um, killing our people and that is still happening but there's a growing um, concern that we have with non-communicable diseases where um, it accounted for about uh, 20% in 2020 of, uh, of the mortality and it's now about 35% so it's grown a lot and it's going to continue to grow and it's really mainly because of our lifestyle so we need to focus on changing the, our lifestyle. So to, today, I mean, and yesterday with this conference and talking about, you know, the, this global awareness, and particularly in Africa, about non-communicable disease as a growing concern, um, that, was, that was good. And opportunities for partnerships, so not only talking about partnership, but really exemplifying how they've been doing part partnership across regions and within countries and across the continent um, that, that was um, excellent to observe. I was also um, struck by the panel with the diaspora panel where you have the ambassadors and also the sports figures talking together about how we promote, um, how we promote health. And, um, and some of the uh, uh, um, ambassadors are just so fascinated by the extent of detail um, that they provided in terms of how they are addressing uh, cancer in, in their country and prioritizing con uh, cancer as a health uh, problem was absolutely fantastic. Um, there were some things that I felt were um, missing. And one of the things that uh, struck me yesterday and, and following the panel discussion and questions was, you know, uh, having a, a, some, one of the uh, questions that came up was like, having a dedicated funding for cancer, so, like, uh, like the, President for, Bush did for AIDS and how much that impacted the whole continent, right? And there was another person who said, no, what we need to do is find investors, some private investors, to invest in the work. And I, and I, was, I was thinking, it's not an either or, because they were saying that governments, African governments, do not have the funding to, to really pay for, for health care. So I'm like, wait a minute, mm -hmm. you know, it's not an either or, it's all those components working together. Well put. Um, yes, mm -hmm. right, all, and then really having our government also prioritize health, because look at it, in some places, you know, we put so much money for um, military, for, for defense, <laughs> as opposed to, you know, so it's really how we prioritize our financing. But really, having all of us work together, all the different sectors working together is really key. And I thought that was missing from the conversation. And actually what's missing was we didn't have anybody from healthcare financing so far uh, uh, to, to speak to us. And I think, you know, in order for us to come up creatively to address this growing problem, we need to engage the banking industry and the private sector. Um, and one, engage them not only to depend on them for funding, but to collectively come up with creative ideas and say, like, this is what we have, this is how much money we have, this is what the growing concern is, this is what's projected. How can we be strategic in, in collaborating to, to address? How can, we, how can we tackle this very serious problem? I would have liked to see that. And also- That's very important. Right? Very, very important. Yeah, that's I, what I, I thought. I think we can, yeah. I would like for the team to really pick that up and uh, yeah, do something Yeah, and about. perhaps maybe next year they could do that. I mean, there are banks. I mean, there's um, Adamasu, who is the CEO and president of TDB Bank in, in Africa that's doing amazing work in terms of uh, securing funding for healthcare initiatives in, in, in Africa, but there are others as well. So, so I would love to see them here, perhaps next year, Absolutely. have a panel on healthcare uh, financing. Um, Africa is the only continent where um, women, um, girls, women die disproportionately than men. Um, the, and um, so, the, given that, I would have liked to see a conversation around uh, gender equity. Um, so there was no panel on, on, on gender equity. Why are women predispositioned to um, 
died a great rate of cancer. There are so many factors, mm -hmm. so it would, be, it would have been nice to have a, a session specifically on, um, on, gender, on gender equity um, issues, so I felt that was missing. As we talk about non-communicable diseases um, having a greater uh, burden on our mortality and morbidity rate in Africa, um, I would love to hear, I would have loved to hear more about what is it that we can do in terms of changing lifestyles of, of folks in Africa, because that is what's proportionately, pro, you know, making us susceptible to, to, um, to cancer. And um, so the conference focused so much on um, di diagnosis and, and treatment rather than prevention strategies around cancer. Uh, so that's another, if I was a public health person, I wanted to hear more on, on that factor because really when we don't have money, that is the primary thing that we can focus on, prevention. Prevention costs so much less than treatment and diagnosis. So what is it that we can do on a large scale right. to reduce people's risk for, for, for cancer? And I heard the ambassador from, uh, uh, from Tanzania talk about um, public health campaign that they're going to be doing, but did not elaborate on, on that. Uh, but, you know, to, we really should have more in the conversation um, about our uh, strategies uh, for prevention. But there's so many things that were presented. I mean, the, you know, the regional trainings that I heard about and strategies for regional trainings, examples of that, that was very good. And even partnering around uh, trials um, that was um, also important um, to um, to hear about and um, I was also excited by the by the global training center that's being established uh, oncology training centers and I'm very very hopeful that we will grow uh, the health professionals that are have the capability uh, um, to um, to address this uh, very major public health problem in, in Africa. Right. Well, you have uh, hinted on a lot of key and critical areas and issues and gaps that, I, you know, it would be great to uh, for the catalyst to really tap into those and try to address some of those gaps. And uh, uh, but. First of all, it was great to see the Ethiopian ambassador there. Yes. Uh, <laughs> alongside the Ugandan ambassador. Yes. And the Tanzanian and Niger. And 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 <laughs> <laughs> so yes. it, 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 as diaspora, it gives us great diaspora. joy to know that yes. uh, they are yeah. really taking this seriously and engaging with these processes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And then, you know, you've talked about, all the, you know, the need to address, to have a session specific on gender disparities. Um, and I would also like to pitch in uh, a session maybe on media, the role of media uh, in telling the stories and sh disseminating information to the communities where global health uh, projects are being implemented. Uh, right on, Vivian, <laughs> because I do not know if you saw me, I raised my hand after the diaspora conversation and after the various countries laid out their plan uh, for uh, cancer strategies. And, and I raised my hand because I wanted to ask, where's the role of our um, culture um, and embracing our culture, elevating our culture, working with media, working with, with um, performing arts and institutions and, and folks to really be part of this whole effort around addressing uh, cancer? Because they have a way of communicating with the public, right, in a way that is engaging and is very informative. Mm -hmm. So why not engage them in that process of in educating our population about cancer risk and how to reduce our cancers and change our lifestyles? Right. Um, so and then the other thing is like public policy. I mean, so, you know, yeah, we've changed the way we eat in Africa. I mean, like every, when I go back home, McDonald's. You know, back, yeah, <laughs> growing. Yeah, there's McDonald's and KFC. <laughs> pastry shops all over, ice cream shops all over. You know, when, when I grew up, it was a treat maybe once a year or so to have ice cream or uh, cookies. Now it's like there's like expectation, you know, that, that we have it on a regular basis when I visit. And they're like bakery shops all over the place. 
you know, that's how we have changed, you know, our, our lifestyles, you know, and that we're sedentary in lifestyle. We don't exercise a lot. And I do not know about you, Vivian, but I know growing up when I was like in seventh grade, that's when us girls were like, oh, we're too cool. We don't need fitness classes. So we used to skip fitness classes. How can we, how can we make fitness cool for everyone, for girls and for boys? And how are we engaging our next generation to be more cognizant about non-communicable diseases. So to what extent are we doing education in the school system uh, to promote healthy lifestyles? Uh, so, I love that. I know. love that. Uh, you know, my brain is good. It has all these uh, butterflies, oh, not butterflies in the brain, but yeah, just- Good butterflies, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just thinking of all the possibilities with yeah. what you just outlined right now. And I think it's very critical because when we're looking at increases in cancer rates mm -hmm. in, say, sub-Saharan Africa, mm -hmm. increases in pediatric cancer yeah. uh, with no uh, healthcare structure to, support, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. support that, I think it's critical to look at how we can prevent mm -hmm. more, um, yeah. you know, cancers. And, yeah, I, I don't know where to start. I always have a lot to say when I'm with you, but this usually has to be a cutoff point. Um, and uh, I don't say cutoff point, but a point where we can add on to add next on. time. I want to add on one more thing. Okay, <laughs> absolutely. This is. <laughs> and that was like, um, you know, some of the ambassadors, and I think it was the Tanzanian ambassador who said that they were really intentional in transforming their health system in a, in a way that attracts people from other parts of Africa to come for treatment, right? Instead of going to India and other places. I so much love that. I mean, as, as someone that has experienced, you know, cancer and, and, and heart uh, problems with my parents, you know, we took them to India, we took them to Thailand, we took them to other places. Why not right here in our region? Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, doing medical tourism and promoting that within Africa, is absolutely right on, and I really fully support uh, Tanzania's efforts and, and, and others, and, and Kenya's another one. So I know I took my mom for a follow-up uh, treatment for her cancer to Kenya instead of taking her all the way to, to India. Mm -hmm. And so we were just there within hours, you know, and we were not exhausted when we got to Kenya right. two hours later. So promoting that kind of really strength in our regional healthcare system uh, so that we uh, so that we can use our own resources right here in Africa to support each other right. and get the treatment that we need. Right, and you know that addresses many other issues outside of healthcare. It uh, it addresses immigration issues. Mm -hmm. The Western world, the no global north, is always struggling with immigrants coming for one of the reasons people want to leave those countries is we don't have a proper healthcare infrastructure. We don't mm -hmm. have a good employment or you know employment opportunities. Mm -hmm. But you know slowly we are trying to see we are starting to see a shift to the south-south migration as opposed to south-north. Yeah. So improving this, that infrastructure in healthcare mm -hmm. will really remove some of the reasons people need to come here. Yes. And we are now in a digital economy. We're yeah. talking about tumor bolts. We're talking about you know, uh, collaborations in the cloud. So mm -hmm. there are possibilities yes. are immense. And yes. uh, it's I great agree. that you brought them on, you know, you talked about this. Yeah, so. I agree. I agree. It's for those of us that uh, in, in diaspora living overseas, it is so comforting as we see uh, our countries uh, develop their healthcare system and strengthen their healthcare system. Because my parents, my, my mom lives in, um, lives in Ethiopia and my dad passed away last year. That's all but right. one of our greatest concerns, well, me and my brother that live here is, is about the healthcare system there. Mm -hmm. And before they used to always come here for healthcare, you know, for America for treatment. And then as I mentioned, um, you know, traveled to India. But as they grow older, that, that distance of traveling you know, the Indian stuff, it's just very difficult on them. But I'm so delighted that in Ethiopia we've grown, we've improved the healthcare system. We rely so much on the American Medical, American Medical Center, uh, which is in our neighborhood that does amazing uh, service. So it's like, you know, there's a sense of comfort. Then yeah. when they get sick, my parents would go there and they would be well taken care of. And if it is something that they could not address, then they would refer them to Kenya or other places. So 
for the diaspora population, I think it's so comforting as we build our medical systems in, in Africa. So I urge all folks in the diaspora, Africans in diaspora here or Europe or wherever they are, to invest in opportunities in, in Africa because it's good for us, it's good for our family. Absolutely. No, again, it's always a joy, a thrill uh, to have conversations with you, uh, Repka. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Rick, you me. My mom would love you because she's like, Rick, I would get your PhD. I'm like, no, mom, I'm fine. No <laughs> well, yeah. the work you do is beyond measure. So, it, so titles or not, you are an incredible human being. You are an incredible advocate. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just so honored to have you as my guest today. So thank Always you. a pleasure, Vivian, to have time with you. <laughs> right, and to our viewers, uh, look out for more videos about what's happening in global health. For now, thank you for watching. Till next time. Thank you.